FOMO. The greatest predictor of human longevity after genetics, the fact that you will live a long time, is not clearing air, water, exercise, not even getting your flu shot. It's not even quitting drinking and smoking. Number two is strong social ties, having close friends. And number one is social integration, having a sense of belonging within a community. That's John Levy, author of You're Invited, The Art and Science of Cultivating Influence. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens. When the world's spinning out of control, it can be impossible to know what to do and what to miss out on. That's called FOMO, which is short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term, and I'm the world's first FOMologist. And this is the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers, people I call FOMO sapiens, how they live and work with conviction no matter what life throws at them. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to FOMO FOMO sapiens. Now listen, it's been a long pandemic for all of us. But one of the things I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I liked about this whole thing was I went to some pretty cool Zoom events. And I'd like to think sometimes I was in the Zoom where it happens. Uh, Sorry about that. Anyway, so what I learned in this whole process of going to these really cool Zoom events was there's this guy out there called John Levy, who is an expert in bringing people together. He started doing this with dinner parties and eventually moved it all onto Zoom. And he is incredible at bringing people together and establishing real connection between people. And the reason he does this is because regardless of what you want to accomplish, from growing your business to creating a great company culture, championing a social cause, or affecting your habits, you cannot do it alone. The people around you define your success, whatever that means to you, and they have the potential to change the course of your life. And so in his new book, You're Invited, John Levy guides readers through the art and science of creating deep and meaningful connections with anyone, regardless of their stature or celebrity. And he demonstrates how we develop influence, gain trust, and build community so that we can impact our communities and achieve what's important to us. Because guess what? We are going to be leaving our houses more in 2021, and so we got to be ready to take advantage. Now, John is a behavioral scientist, and although he had no money, reputation, or status, he was able to convince groups of Nobel laureates, Olympians, celebrities, Fortune 500 executives, and even an occasional princess to not only give him advice, but cook him dinner, wash his dishes, sweep his floors, and then thank him for the experience. This private community, based around this dinner experience, became known as, quote unquote, the influencers, and it was named for the members' success and industry influence. Since its inception more than a decade ago, the influencers has grown into the largest private group of its kind worldwide with a thriving community, both in person and through digital experiences. And I'll tell you, the people I met at that event, and some of them have been on this show, for example, Dr. Emily Balchettis, really smart people. And so I wanted to have John on the show just to talk about, number one, why he does this, because it's kind of interesting, and then talk about how we can reemerge in 2021 using the things that he has learned in running all these dinners to emerge successfully, meet great people, forge connections, despite the fact that we're all really out of practice and just kind of have a great rest of 2021 and beyond. Now, for this week's small ask, I'm actually going to take a page out of the stuff John talks about and ask you for your help in helping me think of great people we could have on the show. I'm sure all of you have ideas of people that you would love to see on FOMO Sapiens. Heck, maybe it's you. Maybe it's somebody you know. So if you know of somebody that could be interesting for the show, please send an email to letsconnect at patrickmaganis.com. The team will take a look. And if it makes sense for the show, I would love to engage and all ideas are welcome. So thanks so much in advance for thinking of great ideas. All right, with that done, let's move on to the interview. So as I mentioned, getting ready for the reemergence in 2021, and I'm starting to think about getting people together when it is safe. And so in order to get going with our interview, I wanted to ask John, who is an expert in this kind of thing, as we think about getting people together in 2021, and for example, putting together a dinner party, how should we put together the list of people we invite? We'll call it curation. And my view on curation is really simple. You want as many diverse backgrounds as possible. And the reason is that, Patrick, you're an awesome author who has created an idea that has shaped our cultural zeitgeist, right? If I pair you off with just a bunch of other authors, it might be nice to have a cohort, but it's kind of more fun if I put you with like an Olympian or like an athlete or something like that and a banker and a, you know, 
editor or something like people of different backgrounds so that way you can all be impressed with each other and be exposed to new ideas um otherwise you all kind of know each other so like you probably know near al who's another writer and shane snow and so on so i really like diversity you know near has been on the show before and um i'm sorry near you can't come to my at least you can come to one dinner party but not all of them but maybe we'll have you come when you're back in town now um you, you, you the, the the book that you've just come out with is it really is framed by the experience that you had of throwing these dinners parties and realizing how to build influence. So before we get into how we can all do this in our lives, I just want to kind of get into your backstory. How did you go? I mean, you're just a, you're, I mean, uh, you're a smart guy or behavioral scientist, but it's not like you came from a family of dinner party host and restaurateurs. So how did you get into this line of work, line of life, I guess? So I, I do want to point out uh, the dinner parties are not of like, there's no money there, right? It's a terrible business model to like invite a bunch of people over to your house to cook you a terrible meal and then pay for everything. Like, it's just, there's no money to be made there. And frankly, like I didn't invite you to hang out with me in the hopes that you'll invite me onto the show. That's just like a pleasant addition. So, um, I guess my background is that I'm really geeky, <laughs> like really geeky, and was grew up really unpopular and figured that if I could understand how human beings behave, maybe I could really fit in and make some friends. It was uh, more born out of like loneliness and isolation, honestly. Like when you, you hear those like superhero backstories, like Batman saw his parents get hurt, I ended up sitting in front of a computer too many days and realized I needed friends. Uh, then I started researching and trying to understand what will connect people. Because just like your dinner party question about who I'd curate, you'll notice there's a lot of novelty when people are from different backgrounds. So I realized that if I want to connect with interesting people, whatever I did had to be novel and different. And people really get confused about this because they think the influencer's dinner is about dinner. It's absolutely not. It's about shared activity. It's about this idea that we have the guests cook, but it doesn't matter that it's cooking. It could be going on a hike together or volunteering in Habitat for Humanity or having a board games night. Anything we invest effort into will actually get us to care more about each other. It's called the Ikea effect. So my objective is to use behavioral science to get people to connect more deeply and have relationships that could really positively impact their lives. So talk about some of the connections that have been made in your, well, first it was physical dinners. Now it's Zoom meetings, which, uh, salons, salons, which are, which yeah. are fantastic. Um, what are the kinds of people that come and what are the kinds of connections that have come out of those gatherings? So it might help uh, if I gave the design of the original dinner. Um, so 12 years ago, 11 years ago, um, I said, okay, I want to bring fancy and interesting people together. Because I realized that if I really want to get good at, I don't know, my finances, fitness, I want to get advice from people who are really successful at it. And in order to do that, I designed a secret dining experience where 12 people are invited, but they're not allowed to talk about what they do or even give their last name. Then I have them do something really stupid, which is they cook dinner together. And when they sit down to eat, they get to guess what everybody does. And the types of people you asked about, they're like editors and chiefs, Nobel laureates, Olympic medalists, occasionally members of royal families and so on. I've hosted over 2000 people across 227 dinners in 10 cities in three countries. Now you might think, and this is, we had a famous journalist come to one of these and she said, I was expecting a phenomenal meal and decent company. I got the exact opposite, which is the food is terrible. It's 12 people who don't know how to cook. But the company is amazing because it's people who are interesting. And so one of the things I continuously tell people is that you don't need a lot of money to connect with the people that you admire the most. What you need is something that's generous, that's novel, and that's well curated. And people will go out of their way if they have an opportunity to connect with people or do something that stands out. Now, you write in the book, and this really stuck out to me, you say, the most universal strategy for success is creating meaningful connections with those who can impact you, your life, and the things you care about. Now that, there's a lot in that. And you bolded mm -hmm. it, actually. You, you made it in big, it's like the big font. And so I, 
I, I yes. spared no yeah, expense that, that, on that. that deck. It was an extra cost for printing and paper, but it was worth it. And so I just want to dig into that because there's a lot in that, especially as we think about the fact that we're all going to be coming out into a new society of opportunities mm -hmm. and interactions, and we have a chance to rethink the way we do things. So again, I'm going to read it one more time so everybody hears it. The most universal strategy for success is creating meaningful connections with those who can impact you, your life, and the things you care about. All right, John, unpack that for us. So when I first started writing the book, I realized that there's a lot of these business gurus out there that tell you exactly what to do to become successful. And so if I followed some real estate buff on what to do, the chances that if I followed their instructions perfectly, I'd be successful are really low. Uh, that's true for most advice. If I did exactly what Bill Gates did or Elon Musk, I would not be successful today. And the reason is that it's born of a specific time with specific expertise and knowledge and access and all these other things, resources. And that's kind of been shown book after book, like originals and uh, Malcolm Gladwell's outliers and so on. Which means that if we are going to really look at what causes people to succeed, we need to find something that's universal to almost all people. And if you really look, what's universal to us is our ability to connect. We survived as a species because of our ability to develop and maintain relationships. That's the most universal thing we all have. And research has shown time after time that if you want to succeed at anything, here's an example. The greatest predictor of human longevity after genetics, the fact that you will live a long time, is not clearing air, water, exercise, it's not even getting your flu shot. It's not even quitting drinking and smoking. Number two is strong social ties, having close friends. And number one is social integration, having a sense of belonging within a community. Similarly, in business, you can chart a company's stock value, employee sick days, and profitability down to the level of oxytocin in their employees' bloodstreams. This was researched by Paul Jayzak, who's a phenomenal researcher, which means that Oxytocin is released when you have like social behavior that's positive, right? So you give somebody a hug, you win a game together, something like that. Baby's born. And so it shouldn't surprise us that if you feel a real sense of belonging at a company, you'll want to work harder and you'll feel more connected to the employees and you'll want to call less or fewer sick days. So across anything, it's our ability to connect and belong. It'll define if you can meet the right investor or the right people to support your social cause. So what I want to do here today with you, I'm going to take advantage of having you on the show to try to, to Ooh, I've always wanted this to be taken is, advantage ready of. because we're about to get some high quality advice about making our cool. 2021 plan. Because let me tell you something, John, I'm ready. I'm like a caged animal here ready to kind of get back into the world in a meaningful, thoughtful way, right? Not just like running around like a crazy sure. man, which is, you know, the, maybe for a little while, but then really just do it the right way. Having had the chance to step back and think and be a little bit more thoughtful about what I'm going to do in the future. So, and so I'd love to, to have you help us craft for everybody listening, the 2021 plan. And I would argue and that it would start with what you call the influence equation, which is the fact that our influence is a byproduct of who we are connected to, how much they trust us in that capacity and the sense of community we share. Okay. So three things. So let's get started. You know, you imagine you've got all FOMO sapiens listeners. Well, you do, you have them with us right now listening. How would you get started to make that plan? So I think the first question is, what do you actually want to accomplish, right? So if, if you wanted to be a successful movie producer, that is completely different than if you want to get a book deal or even get your kid into the right school or promote an organization like Black Lives Matter. And once you're really clear on that, there's this kind of odd uh, trick called the prize law. And uh, it works like this. In, let's say, Hollywood, and you want to work in Hollywood, I think the size of the community is about 400,000 people. The prize law states that in any group, if you take the square root of the group, 
those are the number of people will do about half of all the work in the industry. Which means that it explains why with 400,000 people, we all know Spielberg, we all know, you know, the Fahey, who's uh, the guy from the Marvel movies, you know, like all these, there are certain names that just keep popping up. That's because a very small group of people do half of all the work. And then it's kind of a long tail. So in general, what I'd say is let's take the square root. It's like 630 something or whatever it is and make a list of about 600 people in that case that would be great to connect with. Now, some of them are going to be globally influential, right? We're just not going to bother approaching, uh, what's his name, uh, Spielberg, because it's not a good use of relationships yet. That's for later on. And once we're clear on who we want to connect with, we want to then figure out a way to get their attention in a positive way with a positive association, right? It's easy to get people's attention in a terrible way. <laughs> <laughs> Stalk them, interrupt them during dinner and go get arrested, right? Like it's, it's easy. So now here's a really, really important point. People confuse fame for influence. So if, Patrick, you say, I want to become the best scuba diver in the country, knowing Richard Branson won't help you, knowing Elon Musk, Oprah, Beyonce, and so the list of people that most people say, oh, I really want to meet, has nothing to do with who they actually need to meet in order to accomplish what they care about. Um, so we want to get really clear on the level of influence. So if you want to get your kid into a, a school, you probably need somebody who's more influential on the community level, like a dean or a headmasters and stuff like that. If your objective is to become a successful actor or entrepreneur, that's probably more on the industry level. And so each group has different characteristics that will attract them to engage. Now, I want to ask you another thing that I kind of think about right now, and I've heard this from a bunch of friends of mine, is I'm a little nervous about reconnecting with people because frankly, I'm out of practice and I feel like I just don't know how to talk to people. And frankly, I'm not very interesting right now. I haven't really done all that much. You know, I don't want to talk about the pandemic for three hours at our dinner or at our walk across the three bridges. So as people prepare for these events, how can they themselves prepare to, to come into a conversation or, or some sort of group experience feeling like they have things to talk about that are forward looking and that show who they are as a person. Hmm. So I think the first thing is there's this wonderful research that's been coming out over the past few years about talking to strangers. And here's, what's really interesting on average, everybody thinks it's going to be a terrible experience and really worried about what to say. And overwhelmingly it's really positive. Right. Occasionally I'll have like a stranger who's just completely insane, but that is so rare. In general, people are functional. And I think the key to remember is that, first of all, everybody's really self-conscious right now. Those who aren't vaccinated are self-conscious and worried. Those who are feel a little bit of guilt potentially for being uh, vaccinated. Even if they have an underlying issue, they're like, is my underlying issue actually good enough to have been vaccinated? So there's a cultural guilt running around right now. Or on the flip side of it, cultural justification. Oh, you fool, you're wearing a mask. Don't you know those don't work? Whatever, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't even know what the conspiracy is. Are. Um, so there's going to be some awkwardness, and that's okay. And I think the key is to little, like, just laugh a little bit about it um, and even lean into it. So... Patrick, how have you been? I don't even know what to talk to people about because I feel like I've been completely boring for the past three, <laughs> six months. All I've been doing is Netflixing. Have you binged anything good I should be yeah. watching? All the shows. <laughs> I think, like, yeah, seriously, like I've gotten my money's worth so much out of my streaming services. It's ridiculous. And so it seems there's this kind of funny behavioral quirk called the pratfall effect. Have you ever heard of this? No. It's, uh, have you ever seen like a rom-com with, you know, Hugh... Ha Hugh, Hugh Grant? What's the guy's Hugh name? Hugh Hefner. Hugh this Grant. is a family show. <laughs> a little this bit. is a family show. So 
Have you ever noticed how he's kind of like awkward and keeps falling all over yeah, himself? Yeah, definitely. It turns out that human beings actually like us more if we mess up a little. It demonstrates that we're human. So researchers had people do interviews and some people spill a little bit of coffee on themselves. And the people who spilled a bit of coffee on themselves actually were liked more and were rated higher. And what's interesting about this is it explains why we like the people who are kind of like bumbling that we kind of want to root for in those Mm -hmm. rom-coms because they're so human. They're to the extreme. Almost if you were to actually meet them in person, in reality, you'd be like, I don't want to be around you. You're annoying. But I'm a strong believer of lean into that humanity. On average, people will like you more. And then there's definitely going to be some that feel the need to be so perfect that they won't be able to handle seeing your imperfections. And if that's the case, then it's probably not going to be a great friendship to begin with. Right. Um, So that's one. The second thing is I'm a big fan of uh, looking at what's called a multiplex relationship, which is, uh, and this is literally the worst name. I don't know why researchers called it this. So the more we have in common, Patrick, the more likely we are to be friends, right? So if we both go to the same gym, like the same movies and read the same books, we're more likely to be friends than if we just go to, I don't know, the same smoothie shop. And so the question is, how quickly can I uncover all of our commonalities without being weird? So on on my site, I developed a whole collection of games, and we've been playing them on my digital Mm -hmm. salons. Um, And people can just download them. And one of them is Get to Know You Bingo. And so it literally causes you to find all of your overlap, and then you can knock it off. Uh, But the sooner you can find common ground, the the sooner you can... um, I think, find something to connect. So that's always been my approach, actually, John. That's probably why we get along so well. I, I'm really good at remembering things about people, where they're from, where they studied, Mm -hmm. what they do, what they like. It's something that I have this very categorical way of thinking. And that if I met you 15 years ago, I'll remember where you grew up, what you studied, where you studied, what street you lived on. That's just kind of how I am. And my, my grand challenge Mm -hmm. in life and anybody who knows me well knows this is not to spill that in the first 30 seconds of meeting you because it's weird, frankly. A lot of people are just like, whoa, back up. It can feel, I mean, they do. And it can feel, it it's very, and by, yeah. I just apologize. So I had to learn this lesson. It's just how I am. And I also realized that it can feel transactional. It's like, oh, you're putting me, you're, you're putting me into box based on certain things about me. Mm. And so uh, it's an area where I've had to develop some EQ um, and work pretty hard at it. But but for maybe people who haven't done that, do you have any general advice about how to break the ice and find commonality without without being kind of, I don't know, strange? Sure. So the first thing I do is I take those high hello questions that people always have that mm-hmm. are meaningless. Oh, hey, how are you? And I actually answer it seriously. So if I'm having a tough day or something, I'll literally be, I'll just say, Patrick, I'm having a really weird day. And then I'll explain why I had a weird day. And the reason is that it's a bit of that pratfall effect. There's this misinterpretation of how trust is built. People think that trust precedes vulnerability. And it actually doesn't. Vulnerability has to precede trust. And it works with with something called a vulnerability loop. So the two of us are chatting and I'm having a really tough day and I'll say, oh my God, my day has really been difficult. I'm super, super stressed, to be honest. Now, if you ignore my signal of vulnerability or make fun of me, trust Mm -hmm. will be reduced. But if you acknowledge it and throw out your own vulnerability signal and you say, John, I know how you feel. I've been pulling 16 hour days and I just cannot wait for this week to be over. That is not complaining. That is demonstrating that I'm safe with you and you can be vulnerable as well. And now we're both at a higher level of vulnerability with each other and trust is demonstrated. So one of the things I try to do is notice people's vulnerability loops and when they throw out signals so that I can complete them. 
There's no benefit in shaming anybody. There's no benefit in making anybody feel bad for anything, even if they say something awkward. Um, it might not be the way you see the world, but uh, but shame is not a great <laughs> response. Uh, so the other thing I like to do is always have like a backup story. Um, and my COVID story is besides working on this book, I built a stand-up 1980s arcade machine from scratch. And when people are like, why'd you do it? And I tell the story that like, I've always really wanted one since I was a child. I'm not somebody who really spends on myself. I don't know how to do that very well. But when COVID hit and I was able to like, my company lost most of its business, frankly, because I do in-person experiences. Um, when I was able to kind of get back on track, then I rewarded myself with like the materials because I had to actually build it from scratch. And I spent several days literally like gluing and programming and everything. You know, it was like the perfect project that was just the right amount of annoying. <laughs> so I could feel like I really accomplished it. Don't worry, I've played it three times or four times since. My wife has defeated me in Mortal Kombat 2. And, uh, and I think by sharing that kind of stuff, that's very human. And people then can share their own stories about playing games or, oh, my spouse, my best friend, my it'll find commonality. But I try to find something that's novel enough that's interesting, but not so novel that people are like, what a weirdo. Yeah. The name of the book is You're Invited, The Art and Science of Cultivating Influence. The website is You're Invited, that's Y-O-U-R-E, invited, dot info. John Levy, thanks so much for being here. This has been an absolute pleasure, and I hope all of you go out and make more friends and have more fun. FOMO. Big news. We now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.